super duper excited about this one. How to play Stud 8. Why? Because Stud 8 is my favorite game. I love it. I used to play a format of this in house games back in Toronto where we would like do pitches and buys and roll your own and uh, declare and all this kind of stuff. And it taught me more about poker and how to think about the game than any other game I can imagine. Obviously it's not as you know, sexy and cool as something like No Limit Hold'em, but there's complexities that combine uh, mathematical understanding of who's ahead and also reading ability because hand reading is super important in this game. The more uh, apt you are at defining a player's range of hands and then you couple that with the mathematical understanding and knowledge of like, well, how do I do against that range? That's where you squeeze out, you know, small value in certain situations where, you know, you, you're definitely going to call, but you go, oh, you know what? I know that I'm 53% here. I'm going to raise. And when you're playing against the best in the biggest games in the world, 3%, that's plenty. Like, that's like what you're looking for. That's a lot of gravy. You have to push those small edges. It's not like playing with blind people. You, you know, every time you have an edge and you miss a raise in a spot like that, it's going to cost you uh, equity. So before we get into all that stuff about the fun stuff, and we're going to get into some fun stuff in this one. Lots of numbers being thrown at you. Okay, so let's talk about the rules and the format and how this all works. If you watched How to Play Stud, you should have an understanding now of how the you know hands get dealt out. Two, two cards down, one, one face up. Then you have another one face up all the way to the river that comes down. The bet doubles on 5th Street. Uh, in Stud High Low, Yes, the low card still brings it in, even though low cards are good in this game. If, you know, the deuce of clubs, which is the lowest card by suit, would always be the bring in. If that's not out there, it's the lowest card that's all automatically has to put in a bring in. And I said in stud in the video that if you're the low card, you should always just bring it in for the minimum. There are some cases in stud eight where you could come in for the max, but I don't advise it. I still think you're better off, unless it's really bizarre tournament situation where you're like all in for one bet, you know, maybe it's worth it to just put it in. But um, otherwise, you just want to bring it in for the minimum. So it's high-low now, right? So we talked about this in the Omaha high-low video and how that works. Half the pot's going to go to the high, and half the pot is going to go to a low if it qualifies, okay? If nobody actually makes a low, it's just the high game. So to make a low, you have to have five cards, eight or better. Now, they can't repeat. So ace, ace, deuce, deuce, three is not a three low. <laughs> you have to have five different cards. So the best low is ace, two, three, four, five, which also makes for a straight, which is a powerful hand that is often going to scoop you the whole pot. So the question is, what's a good hand in this game? All right. Well, let's start with the top starting hands, like the top low hands, right? Um, top low hands would look like ace, two, three, three, four, five. You know, if you had three, four, seven suited, like any three, what we call babies, babies are eight and under well, that are suited. It's a pretty strong hand. If you have a suited ace with it, like, you know, ace three, five of spades or ace four, five of spades, those are very, very powerful, 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 powerful starting hands for both the high and the low, right? Um, in this game, you don't necessarily want to commit to just half the pot. That's why uh, we'll talk about high pairs later and how for some of you beginners, you might be better off avoiding those. Um, and some trashy low hands that just don't connect, and we'll get to that as well. But for now, we're going to talk about the powerful starting hands. That's a very, very powerful essentially two-way uh, starting hand that encompasses low and high. Now, there are some strong high hands, of course, that uh, only go one way. Obviously, if you have rolled up hand, you know, rolled up fives, like if you're dealt fives in the hole and a five up, it's about as strong as you're going to see. And also if you get aces, especially aces with a low card, right? Because now you have a two-way hand. If you have ace, ace, three versus ace, ace, nine, the ace, ace, three is actually a lot better because you could backdoor a low. Just because you don't have a three card low, you know, doesn't mean you can't make one. And as a general rule, as I said, if you're going for low, you don't want to play like ace, deuce, 10, ace, deuce, nine. You want three low cards. You don't want to play three, four, queen. You want, you know, just to chase. You want to start with three, hope you catch a, four, a low card on four. Now you have a powerful hand because you got three shots at catching your low. And also maybe, you know, making some pairs, making some straights, making some flushes to get you the whole pot. Now there's some other, what I'd call situational high hands that you can play. Um, that would, that would include hands like, you know, kings, queens, uh, especially if there's not an ace out. If you, if you have an ace raising and you've got split kings or split queens, a lot of the time, especially in a, you know, if you're at an eight handed table, you should just fold these hands, right? Because what are you really hoping for? If you've got king, king, jack and an ace raises, he's either saying I've got three low cards, right? Or he's saying I've got aces. Now against that range of hands, the kings just don't do that well. So 
Um, for the most part, you know, anytime a card higher than yours raises and you're just going high, the worst types of hands to play in stud eight or better are the second best high hands, right? So if a king raises and you, you know, in stud eight especially, and you have queens with a queen up, that's a fold. I know in stud high you wouldn't because in stud high, a king is gonna raise a lot more than in stud high low. In stud high low, what kind of king is gonna raise? Pretty much just kings. They don't steal as much because, um, you know, in stud eight or better, just because there's a deuce and a three behind you, which in stud high would be like bad cards, they're not bad cards in stud high low. So, oh, I have a king. That's not a steal card. A steal card in, you know, stud eight or better is an ace because it goes both ways. It's a very, very powerful one. Or even a low card. Having like a five up is stronger than having a king up. So steals you may see may come from, for example, let's say I'm, you know, in middle position and I've got a five up and I just have like ace king in the hole or ace queen. And there's a queen and a king behind me and a three bring it. Now I raise here. It's kind of a steal. Like I have somewhat of a two-way hand. I've got a little bit of high. I don't really have anything. If the, but the, I know that the queen or the king, they're not going to play unless they got a pair. So they're kind of like dead cards. The one I'm worried about would be the low card, the bring it. Because if he has three to low, he's going to continue. And if he catches a low card on four, that could pose a problem for me. So now let's take a look at some other like non-automatic, situational, low-type hands you might play. A hand like, you know, split fours and a five, you have split sevens with an ace, or even a hand like, you know, ace, queen, five of spades, which gives you, you know, a good flush draw type hand, and you've got, you know, some high pair potential. Now, these hands are not as strong as the top tier hands, because by fifth street, you could have a really, really bad hand. Like, you start with four, four, five, and you catch a queen on fourth street, you, you know, you, you're, <laughs> it's not good. Now, having said that, if you can get these hands heads up, let's say, for example, split sevens with an ace. Let's say a five raised, right? And you have a seven up with a seven ace in the hole. You can three bet here because your hand plays pretty well heads up against the three card low. And you've also got a backdoor low draw yourself. You've got an ace and a seven. And of course, like I said, you've got the high pair. Um, that's a hand that, you know, in that situation, you, you might want to play. However, that same hand, like split sevens with an ace, let's say a king raises, okay, and a deuce calls. Now, all of a sudden, you have an iffier spot. Maybe that's not as good of an example to seven, seven, eight. But let's say you have split fours with a five, more specifically, right? King raises, deuce calls, and you got split fours with a five. You don't want to play these second best hands, okay? You know that this guy's got kings. Almost 100% of the time, he's going to have the kings. Very few times, he's going to have two baby hearts or some sort of, you know, pocket pair or whatnot. But the low guy, he's probably got three lows. So you're behind in the low, you're behind in the high. You need a miracle four street just to get back in the race. Get out. You know, what do you, you try to make two pair. The Kings could make two pair, beat you. You catch a low card. The other guy catches a high. You, just get out, right? Those are the most dangerous hands. So these situational low type hands are the ones that separate the great elite players from the mediocre or weak ones because they're tougher to play, right? So it takes a lot more hand reading skill. I play them probably a little bit more than I should because I feel like I have a good read on where my opponents are at when they've paired and things like that. But as a general rule, you don't want to be chasing second best highs and second best lows. Well, now let's take a look at some hands that, you know, if you're playing stud high, you'd consider, but for stud eight, we're going to call these trash hands. Now, trash hands look like, you know, three card straights, nine, 10 jack. If you got, you know, nines with a four, ace, queen, jack, two fives with a king, or, you know, the last grouping I would call is like three flushes that have two high features and one low. Um, before, before I mentioned in the, you know, situational ones, you have like, you know, ace, four, jack of hearts. That's not, that's not bad because you have two low features, one high. You have the ace, which is very, very powerful in this game, as I said. Uh, the ones that are trouble is like king, jack, four, as I said, because you're only playing for the flush. And a lot of times you'll end up drawing to half of a pot because the other guy's already got half locked up and you might not even have a pair. So just imagine, for example, you're up against the low draw and by fifth street, he makes, you know, he's got four, five, six showing and you started with king, jack, four of spades and you caught the seven of spades and then you caught like a queen. So you have king high on fifth street and a flush draw. This guy might have a low already, right? And you have nothing. So for he might have, he might have you scooped both ways and you're going to call fifth street, sixth street and probably have to pay off seventh street, the big bet streets, hoping to chase to just get your money back, right? Not ideal. So try to avoid the hands that have two high features, one low, unless that high feature, of course, is the ace because that's a two-way hand and it's considered a low feature. Now, the reason you don't play like, you know, well, nines, nine, nine, four, is obviously because there's a lot of overcards 
and uh, you know anyone who has a higher pair than you know that's that's starting with a ten jack queen king that's raising or an ace, you puts you in a bad spot. And again, you're hoping that these nines hold. A lot of times, what happens with you, with just nines is let's say you are up against two guys with lows, right? So one guy has deuce three, one guy has four six. You know, one guy catches a queen, another one catches a, a ten. You know, nothing. They don't pair nothing. You got nines. You're still in there with the nines. Well, they miss their low, but they end up making queens or tens or nines. That's why kings are much better than nines. It's not the only reason, obviously. But uh, if you're up against low draws, it matters to have an even higher pair because there's a lot of backdoor, stupid, goofy hands they can make. Well, the next group of hands we're going to talk about are trashy low hands. So a trashy low hand, what's that? Like a deuce six eight, three seven eight. Now, you're drawing to a rough low, like the eight. It's not powerful. The best you're really trying to hope to make is an eight. You don't have a three card straight draw. You know, if you don't have like three suit, you're, if you're, there's another low card out there, it's probably, if they're playing, they probably have um, a better three card hand than you do. So you're already starting out of the gate behind and you generally don't want to come from behind in those kind of situations. The other really important factor that can turn what looks like a good hand into junk is dead cards, okay? You need to really pay attention to what's out on the board. So for example, say you start with three, four, six, right? It's a good strong hand, three cards straight, you know, three card, six low draw, it's pretty decent. Well, look around the board. No, you're like, oh boy, there's two fives out, three fives. That's important to know, right? Because it makes your hand a lot weaker. I'm not saying that it's good enough or it's, it's, it's important enough for you to fold in this case, but there are gonna be situations where the cards you're looking for are so dead and there's a bet and a raise in front of you that you just go, you know what? Never mind. Like, say you started with four, five, six, very strong hand, right? And there's two threes, two sevens, and an ace out. The ace raises. The seven raises, the three raises, the ace three raises. Well, you have three card six, it's pretty good, but you know, a lot of the cards you need are gone. Two threes gone, two sevens gone, an ace gone. So, you know, you're probably up against at least one high pair or something along those lines, and maybe a better low, you know, low card, low card hand that doesn't have the same drawback as you do, which is dead cards. So this is that what intimidates like holding players a little bit is the memorization thing, but it's not that tough, guys. On Third Street, take a look around, look at your hand first, see what you need. If you see a bunch of stuff that you need out there, maybe consider folding. So the next thing I wanna cover is the types of hands you wanna play heads up versus multi-way. So, you know, you have some of those situational uh, two-way hands that I talked about, like sevens with an ace. This is a hand you wanna get heads up. Or for example, if you do have a high pair like kings with an ace, if you are gonna play kings and a five raises in front of you, you, if you're gonna play it, you wanna three bet the kings to get all the, like, the raggedy lows out. The more, the more is not the merrier when you have a high pair. Now, the kind of hands that you want a lot of players in, well, let's look at, you know, ace, deuce, three, three, four, five suited, powerful scoop type hands. Now, that doesn't mean you don't raise these hands, you still wanna like, you know, increase the size of the pot, but often like, say for example, if a king raises, you don't re-raise with four, five, six of hearts. It's not a hand to re-raise with because it's like, yeah, well, you're, you're behind the kings for now, Fine, you still have a much stronger hand, but the more players that decide to jump in, the better for you, because a hand like that plays even better multi-way than it does heads up. The Kings is excited if you re-raise. He obviously would hate the fact to know that you have four, five, six of hearts, but if you're gonna play, he'd rather you re-raise. So don't do his bidding for him, just call and suck some other people in. Now, if, a, if another low card raises and it goes call, 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 and the King calls, you can do what's called like the wraparound, right? You just wee, you can come back to you and you just back raise and just get a, get a cap in on three. What a cap on three will do for you a lot of times, it will tie you to the pot. Even if you hit, you know, you blank out on fourth street and blank out on fifth, you might even call on sixth street, like with just that hand alone, if the pot's big enough. A lot of times in these like whirlwind back raise situations, you see cap three, cap four, cap five, or you know, two bets on five that just force you in no matter what you got to even try to hit perfect, perfect. Okay, let's move on to fourth street now. Let's look at some situations where you want to fold because generally speaking, if you've played third street, the bet is still small on four, you're getting a good price. So most of the time you're going to want to continue on to fifth street. So let's look at some situations where you might not. Let's say you started with three, four, seven, right? You know, decent low hand. Now you catch a king. Well, that doesn't help you at all. Well, the deuce that brought it in, who called your raise or even raised coming in, catches an ace. This would be a good time to fold, right? The ace already beats you for high because you got king. He may have like a, if, the ace always helps him as a general rule. If a low card catches an ace, just assume it always helps him because either A, it paired their ace or B, it gave them a strong four card low. Now in this case, you are you could be way behind against ace deuce. If he has three, four in the hole, for example, or even if he has an ace, either way, your hand is not worth taking the card off in here because what happens is 
Now let's say you catch a deuce. You're like, oh, okay, cool. I'm back on the low draw. I have king high and a seven draw. Well, he catches an eight. Well, you're like, oh, cool. Uh, you know, maybe the best he can have is an eight low. He's got ace high and an eight low and a, and a wheel draw. So you're just behind the whole way, right? So sometimes your fold on four street is really designed to prevent you from being in really bad spots that are gonna cost you a big bet on five, six, and seven. This is even more true for tournament poker, right? Because in tournament poker, you have to covet and, and like, you know, just cherish these chips. You don't wanna put yourself in these situations where you know you're forced to put in three big bets in, you know, in the hopes of getting half or uh, of, of catching what you need. So you wanna be like, you know, in, in much better mathematical situations than a spot where a guy catches an ace. As a general rule, as I said, Anytime someone catches an ace that started with a low card and stud eight is a bad card. That's not to say you should always fold, okay? But let's say, you, for example, you started with three, four, five of hearts and you catch a king. It's just too strong to just fold on four. You have, it's, it's a small enough bet where you have enough incentive to try to get back on your flush and straight draw because you have a little bit of both. Now, aside from, you know, an ace hitting specifically, typically when you start with a three card low, you know, you miss on four street, it's usually right, especially in a multi-way pot, to take one more off. Now, there's exceptions to that rule as well. Let's say, for example, you started ace four five, very strong three card wheel hand. That's a, a very, very good hand. Now you catch a nine and you're up against the king and some guy with three, four hearts, right? Well, in this case, if you close the action, maybe you can make a case because there's like a lot of money in there, especially if it was three bet on three, where if the king bets, the low card calls, you could like over call. But if it goes bet raise in front of you, you have like ace, four, five, nine. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> you don't want to play this. Or another situation is let's say the king bet and you're in the middle and you've got like five, nine showing and the three, four hearts is behind you. <laughs> you don't want to call here because what's going to happen is you think, oh, I'll call and see the turn. Yeah, it's not going to be so easy. The king's going to raise, right? The king's going to bet. You're going to call. Now this three, four hearts is going to raise a lot. This king might re-raise or call at the very least. Now you put in another bet and another bet and you're, Behind the low, you're behind the high. Again, you're second best in both ways. We want to be leading whichever way we're going, especially in these multi-way pots. You want to be drawn strong. Okay, so we talked about spots where you want to fold on four. Well, let's look at some spots where you want to continue on four, right? Anytime you improve, right? If you've improved your hand in some way where either you've, you know, caught a four, four, four parts to your low or you've paired because, you know, a pair can, let's say you started with ace, four, five and you catch a five. Now, unless it's open, nobody knows that you've got that specifically, and this can help you down the road. You can make two pair and a low. You know, it's worth. It's always worth seeing at least one more bet every time. Any time you've improved. Um, other times that you'd want to consider continuing when you know you don't necessarily hit your perfect card would look like this. Let's say your head's up and you started with ace four five and you catch a jack. Not a great card, but you're up against the guy with four six. Okay. Now. You're going to be getting like five to one when he bets to call here. There's a lot of cards that, that combinations of cards that you can catch and he can catch that in, within one card for this five to one, you could turn into the favorite instantly on fifth street. So let's take a look at some of the combinations of cards that I'm talking about. Well, obviously if you catch an ace, you know, you make aces. If he catches a nine, no matter what he's got in the hole, you're going to be a favorite. Say you catch the three, giving you a wheel draw, giving you a wheel draw and ace jack high. He catches a 10. If you both catch a jack, for example, you make jacks, he's now got a low draw. In, in all of those situations, you go from the underdog on four street to the favorite on five. So getting five to one, you definitely want to continue despite the fact that, you know, it looks like you're behind on four. Let's move on to fifth street, which is essentially the street that I love the most because it's where you combine, as I mentioned before, hand reading skills, with math skills and understanding the math. Because once you're able to read an opponent's range of hands, uh, if you know or you've like studied the game as much as I have, because I love it so much, I can formulate you know, uh, an average of all the ranges that I'm up against and know that like, okay, against all the hands he could have, it's a raise, right? And sometimes I know even more pinpointed than like, you know, he could have this, this, or this. I've got it down to like two combinations. Now, the more accurately you can read what your opponent's starting hands are, the, the more like you can make sure that you squeeze out those value raises on fifth street or those value bets uh, when you're supposed to get that. Because again, most of these limit hands, they're going to go to the river if two hands are pretty close, but it's the guy who gets the raise in or make sure to get the bet in when he's 52% and the other guy's 48. And you know, it's the ones that are on the weaker side, the not as experienced players that are not betting in these spots when they have these small advantages. So let's just take a look at an example here in this diagram. 
So let's say you started with Jack Jack 9 and you catch a 6 4, and your opponent started with 4 5, called you, now he catches a 10. All right? So now we can put him on a different range of hands. Let's say, for example, we think, you know, he's got Deuce 6 or something along those lines. Well, against Deuce 6, as you can see, we're 52.32% to win. So we're a favorite. Let's say he has Ace Deuce. Now that Ace is a scary card because if he pairs the Ace, he overtakes our Jacks. And in this case, it's basically right about 50 50. Well, what if he has ace four for a pair of fours in this hand? Now, all of a sudden, we go up to 57%. Now, notice this. If he just has some raggedy low, and when you get really good at this game, you'll be able to figure out when they do that. If he's got like a 3-8 in the hole, well, now you've moved up to 61.16%. So one of the reasons why I talk about like beginners you know, kind of avoiding jacks is because they'll get themselves in a lot of bad spots, but the really good players will recognize these situations and go, whoa, on 5th Street? I'm a mathematical favorite and they're going to know so. Um, and you can actually not necessarily like push the envelope, but, but notice like all the ranges that I was up against. If your opponent is on a low draw or has a pair that's not higher than Jack's on fifth street, you should be continuing. You know, you, there's no reason to fold just yet unless, you know, he's got the ace up sometimes and you feel like, you know, he may have, uh, you know, there's potential that he has, you know, aces as well as, uh, um, just a little. But if he did, man, you'd be out before that. Because I mean, if an ace is raising up, you don't want to be playing jacks. But by fifth street, if your board, if your opponent's board breaks off or they got too low and all of a sudden they catch a high, you can put you can put a bet in, you can put a raise in maybe if the opponent is silly enough to bet into you. Now, on sixth street, there's a general rule in stud games, okay? That when you fold, you should generally fold on either third street, fifth street, or seventh street. I did the 7th Street. Now, there are a few exceptions, of course, as we mentioned before, where you want to fold on 4th Street, and there are some on 6. But generally speaking, if you've played past 3, played to 4, played to 5, unless your opponent catches really stupid good, and, you know, there's a very high chance that you're drawing dead, if you called on 5, you made that decision to call on 5, you probably have to call on 6. So now we get to the river, and guess what I'm going to tell you about river play, right? If you've been watching any of these videos, you know. If you got anything, just a low. Anytime you have a low, you know, you pretty much have to pay. If you have a pair, sometimes as little as ace high. If your opponent's board is three, four, six, ten, and they bet every every street, and you end up with just ace high, like ace king high, for example. Sometimes, if you know your opponent didn't have a pair going into sixth street, hope they don't have a straight. You still might have to call if the pot is big enough. Certainly, with any pair, um, you pretty much have to pay. And of course, if you have a low and a pair, that's a no-brainer because you got a two-way hand. So again, don't try to be a hero and making cute folds on the river. If you got any piece, high or low, go ahead, press the call button. The other thing to think about on, on river situations is sometimes, literally, and I just played in a tournament this week where we both did this, the guy has the low board showing, I've got kings and fives or something like that, or just kings or something, and he bet on Sixth Street, I called. He bet on the river in the dark because he had the low already, so he's free rolling, and I called in the dark. Why would I just call without looking at my cards? Well, because I know I'm calling and I know I'm not raising. So let's say I just had kings. If I make kings up and he's got three, four, six, eight showing, I'm not raising him. There's no hand I'm going to raise him with. So in these situations, you'll often see players bet in the dark, call in the dark, and there's nothing wrong with that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you've enjoyed the whole series. I know it's a lot to take in, so you maybe bookmark this, go over this. I actually cut a lot of this video out because... There's so many cool like simulations and stuff I've been doing. It's actually making me a better player, which I'm thankful for. So uh, I want to thank you guys for watching these things because it's inspired me to improve my game as well. Because every time I teach, the more I talk about something, the more it reinforces, the more it makes me question what I'm saying. Like, was that dumb? You know? And of course, I read the comments occasionally. I delete a lot of them that are annoying, and I will continue to do so. And I will send you to the ban hammer and <laughs> remove you from YouTube. You'll be gone. The YouTube people are going to come to your house. And I say, sorry, are you Ranger 4596? Come with me. Handcuffs. Going to jail. Okay? That's, that's, that could happen. I don't know if it's true, but I'm just saying it could happen. Just think about that next time you try to post something stupid on my channel. Anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed it. See you on the next one.